Welcome back to Making Money Matter, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I have the absolute pleasure and honor to have my friend, Andy Sheckman. He is the president of Miles Franklin. They are a full service precious metals dealer based in Minneapolis, offices in Florida. Now, Andy and I met in person a year ago, almost, uh, at the Rick Rule Investment Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. It is coming up again, ladies and gentlemen. I will put the link below. I'm doing a shout out to all the Aussies out there. Come on, let's get a big Aussie contingent going across to the Rural Investment Symposium because there's a few um, Australian companies going to be presenting there. You have no idea how good this event is. Andy will be there. He got the Best Speaker Award at last year's conference, and I've got to tell you, it was bloody fabulous. So when I last spoke with Andy... I pose this question, why don't un people understand precious metals? And a year later, I'm probably going to pose the same question to him because I get a lot of you reaching out to me saying, oh, my goodness, the gold price has gone up so much, I'm going to sell all my gold or it's just too late to get in. So, Andy, welcome to the program. It's great to see you. And before we get started, I want to also say, if people want to reach out to you and get your price list, they can get it from, uh, just send an email, guys, to info at miles, M-I-L-E-S, milesfranklin.com. They've been in business for over 30 years. They know their stuff and their prices are pretty damn good. Wish I bought some more a year ago, Andy, but that's a whole other topic. But let's go back to the question I was just asking. A year ago, I said to you, why don't people get precious metals? I'll pose yeah, it again you're very sweet, later. and it's great to be here. And just one point of clarity, the price list that we will provide is much better than what we post online. We only allow a little bit of up to 10000 online. But if you want the really special price list, please send it to Info Miles Franklin or any questions that you hear about what we talk about tonight. But thank you for the very, very kind introduction. And yeah, uh, being with you and... and um, and others at the Rural Symposium has, have been the highlight of, of the last two years that I've seen you there. And uh, it is great. It's a great show. It's one of the only ones that I go to. Um, yeah. I go to two a year. That's that's probably the most important one. So I do recommend it as well. Um, why don't they know gold? Well, you know, I mean, in large part, it's been whitewashed out of the financial vernacular in the United States for you know quite some time, for a very long time. And, and, and I think you know, people, a whole generation, uh, the second two generations have grown up uh, under the fiat system mm. where traditional assets rule. Um, fortunately, when I started my company with my father 34 years ago, he gave me the greatest gift that that anyone has ever given me. And I, I try to pass it along. And it's that is to pay yourself first. Yep. to allow yourself to allow the laws of compounding carry work for you rather than against you. And it doesn't always have to be compounding of interest. It can be compounding of time as well. And my father said to me, I was barely 20 years old, and he said, listen, we're going to start this company on a wing and a prayer, and um, I won't allow you to make the same mistakes that, that I did as a younger man. Every time you get paid, you'll put a portion, something, into gold and silver. So I look at it not as an investment. First and foremost, to me, it's wealth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That has outlived everything the world has ever thrown at it, from German hyperinflation to the Great Depression to every pandemic to two world wars. Um, you know, I, I I look at it as wealth. And you go back to the Bible, and kings and queens and emperors and pharaohs didn't own gold by calling their gold dealer. They owned it as a form of immutable wealth that passes on through the generations. And that's how I look at it as an asset I hope I never need to use. And if I do, I'm damn glad I have it. If not, I'll pass it on to my children, but it, it could be for an opportunity. It doesn't always have to be the black swan where we use gold. To me, it's wealth. And maybe you want to go buy a new home and you've been accumulating gold that has risen by 9.1% per year since 2000. Most people think the only way to retirement is, is, a, is a road paved with mutual funds and stock certificates. Yet, to your point, gold has outpaced the S&P 500 by about 1.2% compounding per year for the last 25 years. Gold is the tortoise, not the hare. And I would say what makes it far more intriguing to me right now, in particular, on top of all of the things we see around us globally, geopolitically, socially, morally, 
politically, financially, economically, I mean, go on and on and on, is that the most, not just the most well-funded, but the most well-informed, Carrie, the most well-informed traders in the world, the central bankers, mm -hmm. these are the evil bastards who are pulling the strings that know where everything is going, one way or the other, they have bought more gold as a group than they have in the history of central banking over the last two and a half years. They continue to voraciously accumulate it. And I guess one of the things maybe we could talk about as we go on through this discussion is how they are using many of these banks around the world, the known and talked about, and I can show you that, the suppression of the Western paper market to de-dollarize, to replace treasuries and the the counterparty risk and the sanction risk and the confiscation risk with gold which has none of that is an asset that has no counterparty risk so if you ask me why don't people know about it you know there are very well-read people out there reading the wrong stuff and i can't understand why more people don't know about it i think to not own some gold and silver as wealth not as an investment is insanity to me and I guess I look at things contrary to the way that most people think, but I'll say this and I'll shut up. Unconventional times carry call for unconventional decisions and unconventional approaches. And while this is the height of con you know being conventional to me, it's, it's really what I believe in, to the rest of, of the United States anyway, not so much to, the, to much of the world who understands it, mm. but to the people in the U.S. owning gold is as unconventional as can be. And I think that's something I try to chip away at every single day. You mentioned the word fiat currency, and there might be some people out there that go, what is fiat currency? Now, ladies and gentlemen, it just means your paper currency, because to me it's not real wealth. It's paper currency, which they continue to print. My question to you, Andy, is how have we got ourselves into such a mess with fiat currency? Is it since Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard and therefore... And that was back in 1971. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, it was just temporary. It's just be a temporary thing that we're going to do here back in 1971. Hmm. How many years later, we're still on the temporary taking off the gold standard. But since that time, the ability to continue to print and therefore devalue your purchasing power, is that why we're getting ourselves into such a mess globally? Certainly, that's a big part of it. I mean, we have a... a, a treasury that's addicted to spending. Our fiscal policy is 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 as it's on what you can't even describe it, how ludicrous it is. We we are insolvent. We're borrowing money at a pace of of a trillion dollars every hundred days. It took us 200 years to do that the first time. Now we're adding a trillion dollars of debt every quarter, about a hundred billion in interest payments over the same period of time. It's insanity. We have, when you talk about exactly where we are, you know, we have $77 trillion underfunded in Social Security. We have uh, in Medicare Part B over $90 trillion in underfunding. In Medicare Part D, the prescription part, about $22 trillion. And that's before government military pensions and after the $34 trillion on balance sheet. People don't get how big a trillion is because there are lots of millionaires out there and billionaires, well, they seem to be popping up all over the place. So a trillion illion sounds like a billion illion. So how big is it? Well, a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. Oh my goodness, just trillion, repeat that again. A trillion seconds ago, and Google it, you'll see it was 31,688 years ago. You have Neanderthals stalking the plains of Europe. You know, you're talking, and that's just one trillion seconds. And we're accumulating over a trillion in debt every hundred days. It's unsustainable. And so when you talk about, you know, the rest of the world understands exactly what is happening. And I um, I think we haven't begun to see anything yet. This is just beginning. And I think that what you will witness is the biggest issue when you talk about, yes, I mean, yes, when we went off the petrodollar standard, uh, or excuse me, when we left the, the the gold standard in 33 and, and, and Roosevelt confiscated gold, that was against the people. But we still promised the rest of the world, you know, after Bretton Woods agreement that you can, which was in uh, 1944, cool. that you yeah. can exchange your dollars for gold at a fixed rate of 35 bucks an ounce. And, and de Gaulle from France started to say, well, you're printing more dollars than you you have at Fort Knox to fund the Vietnam War, the guns and butter thing. And he sent warships over to New York Harbor filled with dollars, said, give us the gold. So yes, we closed the gold window. At that point, temporarily, 
The dollar was backed by nothing. These countries could no longer redeem their dollars for gold because de Gaulle nearly bled probably close to half of it. And so then it was fiat, but it was the protection of the Saudi kingdom, Kerry, and and by extension, OPEC. Three years later, Henry Kissinger struck a deal with the Saudis. We'll protect you, but for that, you will value all um, oil around the globe through OPEC in dollars, and then you'll take the proceeds and put them in treasuries, the excess, and put them in treasuries. Well, if you look at what we've done up to this point over the last several years, it's just beginning. You know, not only did we sign an executive order to go green, which is the linchpin of the dollar hegemony, but we've weaponized the dollar, and we are going around the world sanctioning countries that view us as being very hypocritical. Uh, Janet Yellen just told China that if you give any money to your ally in BRICS, the two charter members, that goes to their war machine, we will sanction your banks, your companies, and Beijing itself. It doesn't matter that we gave $200 billion to the Ukraine with little or no congressional oversight, mind you, but we can do that because we're the world reserve currency. And they just voted to confiscate the Russian Forex reserves and give it to the Ukraine. Now, that's a line... You cross that line as wow. the world reserve currency. It is not our prerogative to tell the world, you can do it, but you can't. Look, we invaded Iraq, Kerry, 20 years ago, and we're still at occupying their country. We went there under the guise of weapons of mass destruction. Didn't find any. We apologize. Sorry we blew your country to hell and, and, and toppled your regime, but we're still here. And we're sanctioning 14-year banks for trading with Iranian banks to buy liquid natural gas. And, um, oh, by the way, the $90 billion that you made last year in oil revenue, you can't direct that. We're going to hold it for you at the New York Fed. So they asked the U.S. last year at the end of the year, can we have a billion of that, please? And at the time, we said, nah, not a good time. So what have they done? They have formally applied to the BRICS. They have made trading in dollars illegal. If you do and own a business, you will be put in jail. Uh, they have uh, are in the process of kicking all Western coalition forces out of the country and they have gotten rid of all green dollar bills in any denomination through every bank in Iraq as of January 1 of this year. So we're viewed as hypocritical, and we can do these things and say, you can't, you can't, and if, if we don't like what you're doing ideologically, we're going to take your funds, and not only take them, we're going to give them to the country you're fighting a war against that we're helping fund. And so the world looks at us as being hypocritical. And so when you talk about this whole ball, how did we get here? We've weaponized the dollar. We've told Saudi Arabia, the linchpin to the dollar hegemony, hey, we're going green, thanks anyway. And we've let our country what run What do you mean by we're going, sorry to interrupt you, what do you mean we're going green? We We signed an executive order to go green. I mean, by 2030, we have to be 80%, 80%, 75% green. By uh -huh. 2050, like 85% green. So we're, no more oil. Know, yeah, so we have we're moving away from fossil fuel, right? And we're moving to renewable energy sources. Well, if you realize it is our relationship with Saudi Arabia, it is the oil petrodollar standard that makes the dollar what it is by telling Saudi Arabia, well, we're not really going to, you know, do much in the way of oil anymore. So I mean, we're not aligned with them ideologically. You have all of these countries that are repatriating their gold from the Federal Reserve. Saudi Arabia is one of them. They just took all their gold back from the New York Fed. Why do you think they're doing that? They are removing any and all counterparty risk to a to a system that they're breaking away from. I'll give you another example. The Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia just recently said, China is our most important trading partner this year and for the next 50. It was 50 years ago, August, that we signed this deal. Those words were thought out very well. And Saudi Arabia, lo and behold, and the United Arab Emirates, which is the seventh largest producer of oil in the world, and an OPEC member, just were admitted together into BRICS. And what did UAE say? We don't really want dollars for oil anymore. Well, Iran isn't, and Russia isn't. All of these OPEC countries are on the Belt Road. How unrealistic is it for when you have mass adoption? Another 36 countries have formally applied. Saudi Arabia has also applied to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the largest financial, regional financial and military organization on the planet. The BRICS have three of the four largest nuclear arsenals on the planet. The majority of human population, larger swaths of gross uh, of GDP, on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. How unrealistic would, would it be for them to say, listen, 
You guys are weaponizing the dollar with our allies. You're going green. You're moving away from oil. Thanks for the 50 years. We're not going to do this anymore. And that's when things get very, very, very real. And that's why I wonder, you know, why do people not notice that gold was the only other asset reclassified tier one in the world? And why don't people notice that the central banks, the most knowledgeable, well-funded and well-informed traders in the world are buying more than at any time in history? All of these things. And you ask me, how did we get here? I don't think we've even begun to get where we are. And one last point, and then I'll shut up again. You know, it's hard for me to speak candidly at a conference where so many of the people, you know, kind of cringe when they hear these things. But I'm going to say something is that I've been right. And everything I've said for the last almost four years, I have been right. And I've nailed these things and it freaks me out. And I think the dollar bulls and the naysayers, the people who poo poo this, are going to be sadly mistaken because the one thing the BRICS are doing and all of these countries are doing in pushing back against the Western hegemony, against the sanctions, the confiscation, is that they are doing it methodically and they're doing it the right way. They're building a, a very solid group in every way, militarily, GDP, uh, uh, shipping lanes, uh, production of, of commodities, development of commodities, uh, militarily, everything, financially, and when they finally do flip the switch, I think it will be a, a very much religious experience for most people because I'm very fond of the term logarithmic decay. Little by little by little by little by little, then bang, all at once, it's going off the cliff. The little by little, it's right here if you see it, you open your eyes. Don't know when the all at once is carried, but I do believe people in this country will wake up to the importance of as Rick Rule says, if you are completely invested in dollars, you're destined to go broke. And if you are not a contrarian, you're destined to be a victim. I believe that. And and there was a lot to take in with that. And if I can go back to what you said briefly, which is uh, gold is a tier one asset. Can you just explain that a little bit more and why yeah. it is a tier one asset and what makes a tier one asset? When did that happen and why? So after World War II, when the dollar took over for the pound sterling, it, it and the treasury were the only tier one reserve assets. And what that loosely means, it's a riskless asset. So if the Bank of England, who would use pounds at the time, was trading with the Bank of Switzerland, who would use francs, the collateral that would be posted would be dollars or treasuries. It's tier one, it's a riskless asset on the balance sheet. Gold always used to be a tier three asset, which would mean that only 50% of the value would be calculated on the balance sheet. Okay. So, you know, it made sense when at the beginning, you know, through the early part of the decade, there were a lot of central banks selling gold. Why? Well, it, it was denigrating the balance sheet, the ability to make loans and stuff as only 50% was there. And it cost money to store and it wasn't paying any interest. The, the, the new kids on the block, so to speak, didn't quite get it. And then out of nowhere, you know, in 2017, when the German Bundesbank made a really big public deal of give us back our gold. And, and within a few months of that happening, the bank of, um, let's see, the, the bank of the Dutch National Bank, uh, the, the Czech National Bank, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, all of these banks said the same thing, give us back our gold. And now, just by the way, um, before I finish that thought, just recently, we had Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, Senegal, Cameroon, Algeria, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia all withdraw their gold reserves from the United States. And so, but all of these banks repatriated their gold from the New York Fed and the Bank of England. And then the following year in 2018, those same banks bought more gold as a group than they did in the 60 years previously combined, did the same thing at the beginning of 2019. And then lo and behold, out of nowhere, the Bank of International Settlements, obviously they knew it was coming. They told them, get your shit back and, and start buying it. Because in April of 2019, the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank or central bank, it's the most powerful bank on the planet. They said, oh, by the way, gold is now a tier one reserve asset next to U.S. dollars and treasuries. Wow. So when you put it together with the central banks who know the playbook that are buying it hand over fist and repatriation because it has no counterparty risk, it starts to make sense as to how this all plays together. Now, I want to read one quick thing to you, if you'll indulge me. Yes. Because I want, I want you to understand that they know what's going on. And they, being the rest of the world, um, and in particular the Chinese, they understand 
exactly what is going on. I want to read two statements to you. And while he's and looking those statements up, ladies and gentlemen, I also just want to point out, because he's talking about China, uh, the Chinese actually own the London Metals Exchange. Probably something now, a lot of people don't really know. But the Well, Chinese that's true, but let's own. clarify that for a moment. And okay. I did find it, because that's an important topic also. They own the LME, and, yep. and the London Metals Exchange is not the LBMA. No. which is the London bullion market. That's the right. LME is all of the base metals that you need to build a, a country, yep. um, copper, tin, steel. And and now they're warehousing those contracts in China. In other words, it's it's the they're warehousing the metals, but the, the contracts are in China, but the contracts are traded in London. They just developed the the BRICS grain exchange. And, and same oh. thing is going to be true here. But listen to this. There's two things I want to read to you that will help people understand why the price is, is how they're doing this, okay? So number one, this was 10 years ago, almost to the day the head of the Shanghai Gold Exchange says that Shanghai Gold will change the current gold market with its consumed in the East but priced in the West arrangement. And when China finally has the right to speak in the international gold market, the true price of gold will be revealed. Now, right now, as food for thought, silver's over $3 an ounce higher in Shanghai than it is in London or on COMEX because they're arbitraging the, the traders who have access to buy in the West and deliver in the East. And we're seeing tons of that right now with tons of gold being delivered to Hong Kong Brinks, which is part of COMEX. The, it's called the OTC market where they can over the counter settle contracts wherever they want. So they settle it in Brinks, Hong Kong, which is then the metal is delivered there off of COMEX at these BS prices and then shuttled over to the Shanghai Gold Exchange in Kilo Bars. Now, Listen to this. This is something that I think is all people need to understand as it pertains to how sophisticated the bricks, brick, the bricks are and the way that they're thinking about things. <clears throat> now, this is a recent article from one of the finance ministers, a Kremlin aide named Yuri Yushakov. And he said a bunch of things that I've said publicly now for three years that we've known that, yes, they ultimately are de uh, developing a new uh, currency for the bricks. That'll be a basket of commodities like gold, the only other tier one asset in the world, and a basket of currencies of the participating countries. We've known that. He also said it would be digital. We've known that too, using probably the Project M Bridge, which we just saw China do the first ever in 2023 cross-border gold payment using digital yuan. It sidesteps the SWIFT system, instant settlement using central bank digital currencies. All of this we've known, right? Here's the part that's interesting. Um, he says, the second part is price. For the moment, he says, for the moment, price is determined by Western speculation. We produce these commodities and we consume them, but we do not have our own price mechanism, which will balance supply and demand. During the COVID panic, the price of oil fell to nearly zero. Now, he's wrong there. It fed, fell to negative 40. Negative. But we understand what he's saying. Here's the kicker. It's impossible to make any strategic planning for economic development if you do not control prices of basic commodities. Here it is. Price formation with this new currency will get rid of the Western exchanges of commodities. And the, to hammer the last piece about the BRICS grain exchange, he goes on to say global prices are primarily determined by the Chicago Commodity Exchange. Moscow and the BRICS seek to move away from trading grain for U.S. dollars in favor of the national currencies of BRICS member states. So they are using the suppression of the paper market of the West, which we do to maintain this illusion of dollar supremacy and strength and bond market. They're using it against us to drain the shelves of everything, whether it be the metals held at the LME, which are also priced on, on COMEX that are Fugazi. And they're Ooh. they're taking all the delivery. They're 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 building a grain exchange and pricing it all around the world in their local currencies. They just canceled huge orders with Australia and with the United States for grain. Um, China did. And they're buying it from Russia and from Brazil, paying for it in yuan, which is what? Immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which is what? The only other tier one reserve asset. And if you look at the exchange for physical deliveries coming off the COMEX right now, going to Hong Kong, if you read about it, virtually nothing is settled in Hong Kong that is not a exchange for physical, where they buy a contract in the West and take delivery in Hong Kong, which then is shuttled over to the Shanghai Gold Exchange. 
So they are using the suppression of these markets against us. And that's why people don't know about it. Mm. That's how we got where we are. And it ain't going to end well when they have, when they are cornering everything from soft commodities like grain to base metals like copper and precious metals like gold, silver, and platinum. And, and they're playing the long game and we're playing tiddlywinks. I think if you go back in history and you look at what people, you know, when they when they turn around and they they talk disparagingly about China saying, you know, they're building all these places, look at these roads they're building. As as Andy just said, they play the long game. And yeah, we do play tiddlywings. We'll build a, a two-lane highway backwards and forwards where the Chinese are building a 10-lane highway saying, hey, we're looking 50 years in advance, not one year. And and I think to your point, Andy, if they are playing the long game, history repeats itself. China, if we look back in history, the Belt and Road Initiative is just going back to the original, I guess, Silk, Silk Road, Road. And, yeah. and, and the trading opportunities that China had. They have very long memories and it's coming back where they want to come back as being, I guess, the reserve currency and the ruler of the world. Now, we, of course, in the West, worry about that, don't understand it. And I think we're now sitting in a position whereby there's a lot of distraction from the wars around the world, which is distracting us from what the reality is. I'd love your take on that. Yeah, I mean, look, Carrie, I think there the media doesn't just do a poor job of telling yeah. people what's important. They do no job. And and like I said, there are a lot of very well-read people. I live in a in a community where the guy across the street from me is one of the biggest traders. Um, he's on the Forbes top 40 list, one of the biggest in the United States. He he wouldn't know a gold coin if it fell on his foot or why to buy it. He says when the market pulls back, he just buys more. That's all he knows. We look at the world so diametrically opposed to one another, yet he's one of the most successful people I've ever met, maybe in a point in a circle. When does all of that end? Mm. I, I'm not I'm not sure. But when you talk about, you know, waging war, when you talk about what we are doing around the world, where we are coming in in a very coercive manner, uh, we are either funding wars or or, or, or involved in them uh, ourselves. We have military bases all around the world and, and it's growing. I think the world is growing tired of it. You look at a country like China as an example, they're not involved in any wars and they don't go around with the gun. Well, people said they go into. I mean, okay, maybe at home they are, but not abroad. They're not. They're not. Yes, maybe they are going to do something with Taiwan, but they view that as as their right. I'm not getting involved in it, but they're not going around and meddling in other countries' affairs where we should have nothing to do. Where we've given two hundred billion dollars to the Ukraine while our country is falling apart. We have open borders where twelve million people have entered illegally. If three percent of those people want to do damage to this country, that's three hundred sixty thousand people. That's a standing army. We have questions surrounding our election, our judicial system, our inner cities are being overrun and there's lawlessness, all of this stuff. And we're borrowing money and giving it to fight wars that we really shouldn't be involved with. So I'm not saying the Chinese are perfect, but the way they go around the world is much more of a cooperative manner. We will fund and build your infrastructure. We'll build gold and silver mines and roads and bridges and maritime channels and train tracks. We'll connect you so that you can become industrialized. Yes, we want a piece of it, but this will be a mutually beneficial agreement. You have 150 plus countries on the Belt Road, 75% of human population and every OPEC country in a cooperative manner. They just created a new digital trading system, kind of like Project Embridge, that allows cross-border payments for all of these countries to trade with one another, sidestepping the SWIFT. And most of the contracts are settling in the digital yuan, which is what? immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So these countries are industrializing in a cooperative manner, but the war, I think the world is getting tired of it. And ultimately, it will lead, you know, these these missiles that are being fired off at $2 million a piece, shooting down oh. drones that are, are a few thousand dollars each. In fact, I just read a story, um, and I think I got it right here. Here it is. Listen to this. <laughs> um no, that's not it, crap. Well, I'll just paraphrase it. I'm not sure where. Oh, here it is, right here. Um, France's Aquitaine class frigate 
has turned tail from the Red Sea after running out of missiles and munitions, repelling attacks from the Yemen, Yemeni armed forces. We didn't expect this level of threat. This, uh, there was an uninhibited violence that was quite surprising. After all of this stuff, he says, after a 71-day deployment, all combat equipment was depleted from the Alter missile to the 7.62 machine gun of the helicopter, including the 12.7 millimeter, 20 millimeter, and 76 millimeter cannon. We dealt with three ballistic missiles and half a dozen drones. He said, each missile that we were firing carried a price tag of up to $2 million. Whoa. Was pushed to its limits by the Yemeni army, arm, armed forces, blah, blah, blah. They had to go back to France because they ran out of munitions and they're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to do this. At what point does it bankrupt a country, <laughs> not only morally and financially, but in terms of goodwill? How much goodwill are we just blowing up around the globe? So yeah, I think it's a very bad thing and Unfortunately, I don't see any sign of it stopping. Um, hopefully it does, but hasn't forever. Who's to say that the military industrial complex won't win this one too, which is another interesting topic. If you look at the numbers in the Silver Institute, they don't talk about silver in any military capacity, mm -hmm. but I have a client who is a um, consultant to the Department of Defense who has told me numerous times that yes, there is 500 ounces in the tip of a Tomahawk cruise missile. Google it. That's just one. All of this high-tech weapon, weaponry and aerospace and engineering stuff uses tremendous amounts of silver and it's not published. So maybe that explains why the Bank of America and a few other commercial banks are short. Bank of America in and of themselves, 1 billion ounces of silver naked short on, on COMEX in the OTC market. Again, a little more opaque. Why? Why would three or four commercial banks be short the largest concentrated short position in any commodity ever traded on COMEX in silver? Well, the military industrial complex needs it, and so much so that the Silver Institute doesn't even list it anymore in the supply demand fundamentals, which was, again, almost 200 million out shortfall between supply and demand. The whole world's upside down, Kerry, and this is why no one knows about gold and silver, because it has been held down, whether to fight wars around the world and build high-tech weaponry or to maintain an illusion of the strength of the dollar and the bond market when you suppress interest rates for 20 years, because the term in economics is Gibson's paradox, the inverse relationship between real interest rates, not, not nominal, but real, and the price of gold. So mm. if you have interest rates at zero, and create all these distortions and illusions of prosperity, you got to kill the canary, and that's gold. Well, whenever you suppress anything, there is a price tag to pay, and we won't get out of this easy. The rest of the world is using that against us and accumulating every commodity from copper to gold and everything in between. And I think before it's all said and done, Carrie, I really do believe the public will know about it, but not until it's probably a whole hell of a lot hard, higher and a whole hell of a lot harder to get. It's interesting at the moment, Andy, as I speak to you, we're on the cusp of coming into May 2024. And right now, the US dollar is at, at all time highs. Uh, companies like Tesla, yeah, pull back a little bit, but it's coming back to its all time highs. I think Apple's now trillions of dollars uh, uh, value as a company. And all these people are looking at the sort of the tech stocks and the AI, and that's where it's all going, but they're not looking at the fundamentals. I wonder if you have an opinion about how much longer we can continue the circus train down the road with these, in my opinion, a little bit overvalued, but is it overvalued if everybody's putting their slush funds into it? I, I, well, yeah, it is. Well, the dollar's overvalued too. I mean, but when you have the Japan carry to you know, the yen going to zero, and they can borrow it next to nothing because they, they, you know, they keep the yields down and then buy dollars, which jacks the dollar up, which hurts again even more, and buy treasuries paying 5%, you know, why would they not? So the dollar is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And, and a lot of these countries have to accumulate dollars to pay off their debts to get yeah. out of the system. So the dollar is strong for now. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think it will, it doesn't have the fundamentals to support it. And in terms of AI, yeah, I mean, when you talk about a market that's going parabolic and only being supported by a handful of stocks, it's very dangerous when you have that shallow a breadth in the market. Mm. And then you see our brain dead current president who just floated the idea of not only raising capital gains to 44.5%, but to tax unrealized gains up to 25% of people making 100 million or more. 
So who are those people? Well, those are the people who create the jobs and have enough money to not only yank every bit of investment they have out of crypto and out of AI at massive gains before they get taxed unrealized and say, screw you and, and pay a, and then get taxed at 44.5% capital gains. But they're also the ones who can just pull up tent and say, I'm out. I'm leaving this country and I'll go to a tax haven on my yacht and I'll and, and I don't need this anymore. And and the jobs that I was creating, screw it, I'm out. We're so stupid in the way that we do things. But yes, when you talk about a market in terms of its historical PE ratio, the lack of breadth, uh, the fact that this is being driven by hedge funds and very little public participation, and I don't I think it's as dangerous as can be. But yeah, in an environment that is inflating the way it is, it might go higher. I think it's very dangerous. I really do. I wouldn't. I wouldn't leave a lot of my money in it. And um, this is just just beginning to see a market that has rallied to this level and to not take something off the table is ridiculous. Look at all of the big um, uh, CEOs like Bezos, like uh, Zuckerberg, like Jamie Dimon that are selling into this rally. They're selling massive amounts of their own shares into this rally. So I think, you know, they understand it's not sustainable, but it's hard to do when it keeps going higher. It doesn't matter how irrational it is, but it is the right thing to do. And it is the right thing to start to, if you have positions in there, profit's not a four letter word, it's a six letter word. And I think that to, to not understand that is to make a monumental mistake. You're never smarter than the market. And in the world we are heading into with the big BRICS meeting in October, Mm -hmm. where up to 36 countries can be uh, brought into the fold. A and the election in November, you know, who knows what will happen? But I think a lot of people are riding out the market into the election, figuring they'll never let it go down. Who knows? But uh, to me, it's a little risky for sure. Okay, we, there's a lot of, so I, 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 there's a couple of things I want to ask you about. One is BRICS. We'll get onto BRICS first, but then I want to bring it right back, Andy. Sure. And I want to bring it back to, you know, going back to what your dad's rule was that you had to buy gold or silver once every yep. two weeks. I want to bring it right back to that. Before I do, the last time the the BRICS met, from what I understand, it seemed to not, like there was a lot of hoo-ha going around about it and that, that there'd be this new currency, there's a BRICS currency, and then it all seemed to have gone quiet. Now, you say there's a meeting coming up in October. Again, it's gone very quiet. Do you expect anything to come out of this? Are you seeing or hearing or smelling or listening? See, I, in my world, I don't see it as being quiet. In the West, it is. It's not talked about enough. Yeah. And the hoo-ha came from James Rickards, who I, I respect. And he, you know, he he writes and speaks to millions of people. And he said that he said a few things that I've been saying forever. He said, one, the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union. The Eurasian Economic Union are all those former Russian countries that end in Stan. And the SCO is the biggest regional financial and military organization on the planet that just allowed into it Iran and, and many other countries like Saudi Arabia have uh, been uh, issued in a limited membership, which is the first stage. They'll probably be by next year full members. But he said, I've been saying that they're going to join the BRICS forever. They're the same countries. Rickard said it would happen in August. Well, he was wrong. But the president of Belarus just said, we need to get these countries into the BRICS. They need to be in there. Let's have a summit. He'll be right. He also said there'd be a common settlement currency. He was wrong, but he will be right. I mean, that thing I just read you, they are doing it. The mistake was saying it would happen in August. So it, it may not happen in October. I mean, there's been, there will have been, there's meetings every day in Russia, up to 200 of them, all BRICS related until we get to the BRICS summit in October where they may issue a common settlement currency. But in terms of doing it the right way, they're waiting for mass adoption. They are 36 more countries have formally applied, plus 20 some that have informally applied. And, and when they have enough of the human population of all the commodities covered, the shipping lanes, the, the military, everything, not just little bit, but really covered, that's when they will make that switch. But there's no reason to do it too soon to cut off their nose to spite their face. Mm -hmm. Wait until they got it. You know, maybe they need to divest more. China had three trillion in U.S. Treasuries. They're down to just over seven hundred billion. Looks like divestiture to me. Uh, but you can't wow. just dump them or you kill yourself. So slowly, 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 and until they're in a position to do it. Um, so yeah, I think 
there is a high probability that we will see some form of a common settlement currency may not happen this year, but what have they done since then? And if you look at all of these countries, they are no longer trading in dollars. They're trading with one another in local currencies and settling everything in gold. All of the excess reserves are not going into treasuries, they're going into gold. So the lack of settlement chips away at the dollar settlement and the lack of buying treasuries chips away at the reserve status and they're replacing it with gold. So whether it be China winning the biggest uh, or winning a massive multi-billion dollar contract from Iran to modernize their airport, they're paying for it in oil. Or or China buying uh, wheat from, instead of Australia, from, from Brazil, paying for it in yuan and Russia, and then they convert that yuan into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Instead of it going into treasuries and dollars, it goes into gold and the other currencies. So they're trading with one another in local currencies and settling any of the balances in commodities like oil and gold. And, and I think they are being viewed that way. These countries are saying enough of, they understand that the weaponizing of the dollar is a real threat. And yeah. uh, and and I think that's why they, and it's not just the dollar, it's the treasury. It's mm -hmm. detreasurization also. Mm -hmm. So as these governments shed dollars and treasuries slowly and methodically, they are resettling deals in other currencies and settling in oil and gold. And that's just the beginning. And and I think this is a trend that you will see accelerate. Um, and, and it doesn't matter if Trump wins, right? Trump just came out and said, we will sanction countries if I'm president, if they start to de-dollarize. Oh, so wow. this sanction crap has to end. And that's what's pissing off the world. And you know, these countries carry the poo-pooers and the naysayers, because none of these countries were industrialized enough, wealthy enough, coordinated enough, sophisticated enough to yeah. do this. They are now, and 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 together they make one hell of a formidable union that over time will find a way to massively chip away at the dollar hegemony, the settlement of the dollar, and the reserve status, because who wants to, to buy, put their excess Forex reserves into treasuries that can not only lose tremendous value, like we saw when rates went up last year, but also can be taken from you if you don't align with the Western mandates. And so, yeah, I think as we get closer to October, it will get louder and louder and louder. You'll hear a lot more about it. And I just want to uh, point out to people, because some people may not know, BRICS is actually uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. That's the, That's the original five. members. That's the original. And they yeah. just admitted last year, Saudi Arabia. Hmm, where have I heard that name before? Oh, yeah, the linchpin of the dollar hegemony. Um, United Arab Emirates, seventh largest producer of oil in the world, also an OPEC country, who are all on the Belt Road Initiative. Uh uh, Ethiopia, um, Egypt, and um, Iran. And if you look at the Straits of Hormuz and the Red Sea, one of the um, new formal um, applicants is, uh, what is it? It is, let me just look, I think it's Ghana. Con uh, I'll find it here in a second. Uh, it is, they have the entire, it is, well, I don't even know. It's it's one of the. I, th I think it's Ghana. I'm not positive. I'm sorry, my, that's my geography no, no, is bad. No, no, but that's okay. Look, it's the I, other side of the Straits of Hormuz. They have the entire Straits of Hormuz and Red Sea Straits covered of by Hormuz Hormuz covered. All of it. Yeah. So it's so, not just. It's everything. It's shipping lanes. It's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's everything, and they're all connecting with the Belt Road, and it's all part of a bigger plan. So and they're doing it in a manner that that will be noticed soon. And that's what people need to understand, that this is not just a little thing. This is them actually understanding the whole logistics of of running an area where you've got to have your shipping lanes, you've got to have your, your belts and your roads and everything else, and that's what they're doing. Now, Andy, before we finish, and, and this is great, let's get you back on and not leave it for a year, uh, but one of the things that our community out there, a lot of people reach out to me and say either... I mean, we're doing an educational event at the Australian Gold Conference this year. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you, it's free. Five o'clock, Monday, the 26th of August, you can come along and we're going to talk about all the different ways from bullion to ETFs to equities, every way that you can and how you can get involved with purchasing precious metals. But, Andy, what I want from you is 
if people turn around and say it's really difficult or uh, it's really expensive, what would you say to them? Um, pay yourself first. Mm -hmm. And it's not difficult. I mean, it's difficult for me to send metal to Australia. Um, I don't, I can't speak for the way it's transacted in Australia and the United States. It's not difficult it's at all. Easy. I mean, it's super easy. And, and, you know, when I started paying myself first, granted silver was only a few bucks an ounce, three, four bucks and gold was a few hundred. Um, you know, if, I don't care if it's one or two ounces of silver, if you never prioritize in, in a very regimented methodical fashion, paying yourself first, You'll never get there. It's like dieting or exercising. If you cheat, you won't get there. If you are methodical and you are regimented, you will allow the compounding of time to work for you rather than against you. Everyone thinks it's only compounding of interest. It's compounding of time. That's what diet and exercise is or building a strength, a, a strong relationship. Same thing is true in investing. If you don't pay yourself first, you never get off the wheel. And I think in order to get out of the rat race, you start every single time you're paid. I don't care if it's one ounce of silver or, you know, a couple of silver dimes that are a fraction of an ounce or, or when you get larger amounts, 20 gold coins. I don't care what it is. But Pay yourself started. first and, and put it in gold and silver and you'll be really glad you did because, like I said, gold is the tortoise, not the hare. It was, it's up, it's outperformed, with the exception of Bitcoin, it's outperformed every single asset period since 2000 and, 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 and up, you know, um, over almost 900%. So it, yeah. it's a big run, a very, very big, big run. And don't be frightened, ladies and gentlemen, a little bit of pullback, uh, right. Recently we've had quite a run in the gold price. Uh, people started getting overexcited. This is a healthy pullback. I've had people ask me, Oh my gosh, should I sell my gold? Yeah. People are starting to sell their gold, but I always say, Oh, just my opinion, not financial advice. I would only ever sell my precious metals to buy another hard asset, whatever that may be. And for me, that's real estate. But again, not financial advice. You do you, boo. But all I am saying and Andy is saying is pay yourself first and take action. Andy, we have to leave it there, but I hope to have you on the show again very soon. But thank you so much for joining me on Making Money Matter. You're the great, mm -hmm. scary. I can't wait to see you in person in July and I will come on your show anytime because I'll, I'll tell you the chinese curse may you live in interesting times mm. between now the BRICS meeting in october and the election maybe the biggest in this country's history in november there'll be very very many interesting things to talk about so say the word color me interested i will be back and uh, anytime you'll have me and in the meantime i hope you and everyone else out there whether it be here in north america or across the pond stays well and um look forward to picking up with you uh, where we left off, hopefully not too far down the road. Andy Sheckman from Miles Franklin, thanks so much for joining me today on Making Money Matter.